Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We now get on to talking about transaction cost approach to institutions. The idea of transaction costs goes back to the work of Robert Coase in 1937 towards the theory of the firm, where he talks about transaction costs involved in the way the firm operates on a day to day basis. Much later, Coase was to write a paper which was pathbreaking and seminal in 1960s on again transaction costs. The underlying principle of talking about transaction costs is that contrary to the belief in neoclassical or standard or orthodox economics that collecting collation and verification of information by firms is costless and similar activity by individuals in the market is costless. Contrary to this belief that it is all costless in reality all these are costly activities involving expenses and the bringing in of these costs considerably transforms the analysis of the economic activities themselves. The simplest market that is conceivable of course, is a Walrasian market, where there are zero transaction costs underlying the assumption of perfect knowledge. But in all non-Walrasian non situations, which means in all real life situations, every economic actor has to spend time, energy and resources on acquiring information whether it is simply a question of how to get from one place to another or whether it is a question of how to invest some hundreds of thousands of rupees. Every information, every piece of information is costly in the sense that it involves a cost of collection, it involves a cost of compilation and a cost of collation and a cost of elaboration and verification. More generally therefore, all transactions involve costs of various types. These transaction costs vary, but in order to look at it in greater detail, we should know also that transaction costs not only relate to information. In other words, they are not only information costs, but the conduct of transactions themselves involve all kinds of costs. The best example of such costs are what later came to be known as Coasean externalities. Robert Coase discusses a very interesting scenario of two producers occupying two adjacent plots of land. One of them owned by a confectioner and another owned by a man who runs a hospital. The confectioner has a job of pounding flour every day to make bread and then baking it and making bread. The man who runs the hospital of course, has the job of curing people, healing them, treating them and getting them well back home as fast as possible. However, the confectioner has to pound the flour, to grind the flour in order to get it ready to be baked and this is a noisy and disturbing activity. And the hospital owner finds that this is expensive in terms of the trauma that it causes in his students that I am sorry in his uh, patients and in the disturbance that it causes among the patients and so on and so forth. So, it is a costly thing. So, question is either the confectioner has to relocate for which the hospital owner has to compensate 
or the hospital has to relocate and the confectioner has to compensate. How expensive this process of getting either one of them to relocate depends upon what kind of legal and political system exists. Ideally, if it were possible to solve this on a face to face basis, then we, they can talk about it with each other and one says to the other that he would give him so many hundreds of thousands of rupees and then the other agrees and they seal the agreement and the next day the other man leaves. It is the least transaction cost. On the other hand, they could go into costly litigation. One could go into the court against the other and sue him for damages and request the court to order this other man to be evacuated from that place, forced to leave and relocate. That is a costly legal process, not just in terms of the fees to the lawyer involved, which is there of course, but the cost in, incurred by the, coast, the court, courts which these people have to bear. And then of course, invisibly behind all this, the salaries of the judges and the various members of the court and the enforcing authority, the police force and finally, all the senators and lawmakers who get paid in order to make these laws. In short, transaction costs can be either very minimal on a face to face negotiation basis or they could be quite extensive in a complex political legal situation. Now, here is a simple case which we discussed where there was a dispute over the use of a piece of property by one person, but there could be a whole lot of other transaction costs involved in the process of production. They could all have a cosine nature. For example, the bank workers suddenly decide to go on a strike and because of that a businessman loses out on that day's transaction and loses several hundreds of thousands of rupees. Question is can he go to the court and enforce that the bank employees organization pays him back the costs is another transaction cost. So, we have a whole lot of costs associated with the legal political institutions connected with the production process in the economy, all of which are sources of transaction costs. Now, Douglas North made a very interesting study of how the existence of transaction costs gave rise to the rise and fall of institutions in a society historically. There are some institutions or rather every institution has a particular set of transaction costs associated with it in the society. There are certain institutions which minimize the transaction costs of the economic processes in the society and there are others which do not do that. According to North, the institutional history of a society might be perceived in terms of whether the institutions minimize or increase transaction costs at any particular point in time. North says that institutions which minimize transaction costs are the ones which come to stay and institutions which increase transaction costs tend to fade out of existence sooner or later. Once again, there is a very interesting study available to us on agrarian systems in South India. where transaction costs constituted a 
salient element in the very structure of the institutions that society had over a period of time. In the Tamil country, which is subject to this particular study in the northern part of Tamil country, it is a paddy growing tract and highly a highly irrigated paddy growing tract, but irrigated with hundreds of small and large irrigation tanks, each with its own command area of paddy cultivation and therefore, villages which cultivated this paddy. Now, the logic of irrigating the fields with the water from tanks involves some organizational problems and some transaction costs. For one thing, not every field had a direct access to the water from tanks. There were a set of canals or channels which went from the tanks down in the command area and from which water had to be taken to individual fields. So, first of all fields which were closely located to the tank had much greater access to water. Fields which were further away from the tanks had lower access to water. So, here was a first transaction cost involved to the farmer depending upon where his field was located. Second, water had to be blocked as it flowed down the channel and as it as the level rose you cut a little channel through somebody else's field, so that the water would flow from there onto your field. This means that you had to have the permission of this man to take water through his field to your field and that set of transaction costs. You have to be on very good terms with him or else you would not get water for your fields. The third consideration was not all fields were of the same quality of soil. Some fields retained water very nicely, some fields had more porous soil and water quickly went through and it was not retained, not good for crops. So, once again soil differences made a big difference. And in this caste also played an important role. Lands which were close to the tank were usually lands which belonged to the upper castes. Lands which were further down the channels away from the tanks were usually lands which did not belong to upper caste, but to lower castes. So, once again where your fields were located depended upon the caste hierarchy in the village. So, another set of transaction costs. So, here is a situation where a large number of issues are involved in simply taking water to irrigate the fields and a large number of things had to be resolved among the people before a, such a complex excuse me complex irrigation system could be managed. So, institutions which managed and distributed water in the village were the most important institutions. And around these institutions grew other institutions in the village. So, for instance, in the 18th century, the institution which was like a local government in the villages was something called Ur. Ur literally means the village. Now, how important the Ur was in its functions, how it could, how, how much it could enforce its views and its judgments on a number of issues depended very much on how important irrigation management was in that village. If irrigation management was central and if the village used a lot of water from the tanks, then the members of the Ur were also members who were regulating the water distribution in the village and therefore, anything that they said was important. On the other hand, if the village was a dry land village with not much irrigation available, not much water in the tanks, maybe 
the water in the tanks might last a month or so in a year, not much. And for the rest of the time, you have to either depend on a well or on rain fed irrigation, that sort of thing. Basically, not very certain agriculture. In all those villages, it was found that the Ur was not a very powerful institution because irrigation management was not central. Why was this? Irrigation management, management was central in these villages because the economics of paddy cultivation was such that everybody had to plan a very homogeneous cropping pattern to optimize on the water use when the water did come in the tanks. So, they had to plan cropping pattern in such a way that they all optimized on water use at the same time, which meant, which meant that the crop calendar was very uniform, moved along with water levels in the tanks. When the crop calendar is uniform, then labor management becomes very uniform, because if crop calendar is uniform, then the peak season demand for labor and off season demand for labor also became very uniform. There were particular periods in the village when everybody wanted labor. There were particular periods in the village where nobody wanted labor, there was surplus labor available. So, management of labor is a crucial issue. What does one mean here? How does one manage to keep laborers well fed and happy when most of the year they did not have work to do? And what was the way in which the employers managed to get workers to do some work when everybody, everybody wanted the workers. In other words, peak season was a time when there was excess demand for labor and when excess demand for labor existed and if you leave the situation to go as it is, wages would hit the ceiling. On the other hand, for the rest of the year, when there was not peak season, but lean season, no demand, excess supply of labor. At that time, a fellow would work for you for a meal. So, virtually 0 or negative wages. So, if you have wages which are following the market, they would go up and down, let us see saw up and down, then market cannot regulate labor market. I am sorry, the market cannot regulate labor relationships labor relationships had to be part of the labor management strategy of the village as a whole. In large number of South Indian villages therefore, during the lean season you had a whole lot of rituals during which all the landed families would made rice gruel and the whole village would be fed every day in that. This is one way in which everybody was fed and that was lean season when there was no work going. Likewise, they had a wage negotiation system, whereby a person would join a family as a permanent farm hand on a one year contract, which was renewable every year. And his wages would be on a base wages would be fixed as so much of rice per month. And around that base wage would be negotiable bargains on bonuses, which he got during harvest for extra work that he did and so forth. In other words, management was labor was not just management of supply and demand of labor, but it was also management of relationship between labor and employer. Now, therefore, labor management also had to happen about the same time. Labor management also had, or had to happen about the same time as water management, as crop management, because everything surrounded, everything surrounded the availability of water. So, these villages you had all kinds of social and political institutions developing, minimizing transaction costs in irrigation and therefore, developing implications for rest of the society. So, the whole caste hierarchy in these villages was found to be organized around water management. Whole lot of institutions of moral do's and don'ts rights and wrongs, institutions of education, institutions of learning skills, they were all tied to water management. So, here is a case where whole societies continue to live for generations like this. Now, 
suddenly in the 1960s the government of India decides that it wants to announce a package program in agriculture. So, the first thing the government does is it says we will give you virtually interest free loans if you want to build wells and pump sets in your, in your fields because this will help us promote this new agricultural strategy, new technology and so on and so forth. So, a district for instance like North Arkat in Tamil Nadu which had the reputation of being a dry land district by 1973 North Arkat they had 15 percent of all the pump sets in India. So, what happens? The farmers are liberated overnight from the compulsion to be a part of a water management organization. They have got their own pumps, they have got their own wells. So, the whole system of irrigation management collapses. Around it collapses the crop management, labor management, in other words every other institution in the society. So, here is a situation where it could be argued that transaction costs were minimized by a particular social organization which existed for a long period. And suddenly the introduction of new laws displaced the economic basis of the social organization which is irrigation management, the, the imperative of irrigation management and it liberated each farmer from having to belong to a irrigation management group and having to listen to the irrigation managers about crop planning and so forth. He could plant any crop that he wanted as long as he had a well and pumps it. He could grow any crop that he wanted any time of the year. It freed him completely from every other cycle, crop management, irrigation. Same way he could employ workers as and how he liked because of course, his crops varied. In other words, the whole organization of rural society which had been for centuries centered around the transaction costs of water management broke down. Here is a classic case where transaction cost economics can be perceived at actual work in deciding the power and role of institutions in village. So, there is a big argument against green revolution in large number of quarters which says that the bringing in of green revolution certainly saved the food economy of the country from crisis. It certainly enabled the farmers to produce enough food for the country. It certainly enabled famines and scarcities to be averted, but they led to the breakdown of the village. The social consequences of which they said is something which cannot be replaced. The question is not therefore, whether green revolution is good or bad. What we are saying is pre green revolution there was a transaction cost regime, post green revolution there was another transaction cost regime but the structure of transaction cost changed completely in the two periods. What was traditionally managed as a local law and order situation now became law and order subject to the state government and therefore, more generalized and institutions of the village were now replaced by the governmental institutions of police and courts and so on and so forth which became regulatory institutions. So much for transaction costs as an option to Marxian version transaction cost economics argues that there is no determinism about any such thing as a production relations or economic base. But the institutional argument of North and others enforce the case for a very dynamic fluid structure of institutions through history as and how they minimize transaction cost the institutions come in to say as and how transaction cost economies vanish the institutions all of vanish. So, rise and fall of institutions in human society historically is explained through transaction costs in this mode of analysis rather than through mode of production and superstructure. The third approach is what might be broadly called the approach of economic anthropology. 
I am using the word economic anthropology in a broad sense because the kind of economists I am I am sorry I am going to kind of anthropologists I am going to discuss here were certainly not people who advertised themselves as economic anthropologists, but their contributions to explaining economic anthropological phenomena is significant. The assumption in economic anthropology is that institutions constitute the liminal conditions to economic conduct in the short run, but in the long run the institutions themselves could undergo morphological changes through economic transformation. It is a two way relationship. The greatest debate in economic anthropology since the 1950s in India has been the debate of tradition versus modernity. There is an argument in economic anthropology that a society which is traditional could have a number of advantages as stability of relationships and stability of social institutions. However, this society would also be a society would be that would be relatively stagnant because there is no growth. On the other hand, a growing economy would promote modernity in society and culture, which would be much more dynamic and moving and changing. So, tradition versus modernity itself became a major argument, a theme in argument in talking about the pros and cons of economic development. And along with this is woven the arguments of great sociologists. Consider for instance the argument by Max Weber. Max Weber argued that Protestant religion grew in those pockets of Europe first, where early forms of capitalist industrial or business organization existed. And that being so, Weber attributed a one on one relationship between the rise in society of Protestant ethic and what he called the spirit of capitalism. Weber was trying to argue that the emergence of capitalism in Europe, I am sorry, emergence of Protestantism in Europe had certainly something to do with the emergence of capitalism. Let us look at this in a bit of detail. Statistically, Weber found that those centers where Protestantism spread in Europe were also the centers through in which capitalist form of industry trading etcetera were prospering. Putting the two together Weber argued that there must be something in protestantism which contributed to the development of capitalism. And Weber's argument ran as follows. Weber said that Weber said that there were aspects of Protestant ethic which propagated behavior which was very much in the spirit of capitalist development. First of all, Weber said that Protestantism as opposed to Catholicism argued that the grace of God might or might not be yours in the life hereafter, but certainly the grace of God is yours if you look upon your own trade and your own vocation as service to God. In short the idea of calling, the idea of calling in Protestant religion wherein your profession, your trade, your vocation was your calling or God given thing to do. 
and in being sincere in your calling, in being honest and committed to your work was an act of worship in Protestant ethic. Now, according to Weber, the idea of calling therefore, was something which paved the way towards productivity, paved the way towards thrifty behavior, paved the way towards austerity which was a crucial in the early phases of capitalism. Secondly, Protestant religion argued that both hen, heaven, and heaven and hell are here in the world with us. They are not to be found in an afterlife as Catholic religion advocated. So, the bringing in of the time frame of human salvation to the present life enable Protestantism to create conditions whereby there was commitment to work, there was commitment to productivity and so on and so forth. This was another of Weber's argument. Granted these, Weber said that the ethics of Protestantism something was something which promoted the spirit of capitalism. And the spirit of capitalism being thrifty behavior, productive behavior, hard work all those things. <coughs> so, religion and the rise of capitalism coincided in particular pockets in Europe was what Weber was arguing. But Weber went one step further, he started doing an analysis of oriental religions and he came to the conclusion that they did not do the same thing as capitalism did in Europe. He thought oriental religions were tying down people to traditions and not creating the conditions conducive for the development of ethic, the, the spirit of capitalism. So, Weber's conclusion was that while protestantism lay at the heart of the development of modern Europe, similar development did not happen in the orient for the simple reason that oriental religions did not permit this. In short, here is an argument about institutions either strangulating economic growth or not. In the 1960s, an American anthropologist called Milton Singer studied South Indian industrialists and was considering whether the Weberian approach could be justified at all because South Indian, South Indian industries were all the ones he studied were Hindus, very traditional, very hide bound in their own ways and very prosperous and growing. So, Singer said well here are very traditional people and they are having been traditional has nothing at all to do with the fact that they grew. So, there is considerable correction needed in the thinking of Weber or in Weberian analysis is the Schrodinger's conclusion. Subsequently, it was found whatever the relationship that Weber found between Protestantism and capitalism, it did not mean a similar relationship should or should not hold in respect to other religions and capitalism. This was Weberian institutionalism. Let us take a brief look at Durkheim. Durkheim could probably described as one of the earliest founders of modern economic anthropology. Durkheim studied suicides and the behavior of suicides, statistical behavior of suicides over a period of time. He came to the conclusion that whenever society was changing rapidly economically, there were more suicides. When there was not such rapid economic change in the society, so number of suicides fell. So, Durkheim came to the conclusion. By, brought, by bringing in a concept of anomie, 
anomie meaning normlessness. Purkheim added as an inference to the statistical information that he presented that periods of rapid economic change are also periods of anomie. Periods of not so rapid economic change are periods of order and stability. In short, here is a causal relationship stated between the level of peace and harmony in society and the rate of economic change in society. Whether Durkheim's analysis was verified on a large scale is not is the second question, but the most important question is that Durkheim found a very solid relationship between people's peace of mind, people's orderliness of behavior all described by the word norm, normic behavior and the existence of rapid economic change. When there was a rapid economic change either for growth or for collapse it did not matter, when economy changed very rapidly norms breaks down. So, there is a period of anomie. So, there is an inverse correlation between social peace and economic change as Durkheim found out. This is a very major institutional concept contribution. Durkheim also argued that social solidarity is another factor which is affected with economic change. In traditional societies, society is held together by a form of solidarity which is organic. Face to face societies have an organic form of solidarity. So, he said these are all forms of organic solidarity. As opposed to this modern western societies had functional relationships which characterize the society much more than kinship and other relationships as in traditional societies. So, where societies were characterized by functional relationships across nuclear groups, Durkheim called it mechanical solidarity. So, mechanical versus organic solidarity is something which characterized modern societies from as distinct from traditional societies. This is Durkheimian analysis. Finally, let us consider a major contribution by a great Indian sociologist M. N. Srinivas. According to Srinivas, there were two major aspects to social change in India. As prosperity came, to particular social groups, these groups underwent two kinds of changes. As prosperity came, one thing that these groups was they engaged in westernization. They started using their money to adopt western styles of living, to send their children to English medium education, to get them to acquire western habits of eating drinking and so forth, westernization from simple things like switching to western form of dressing to adopting western lifestyles on a much larger scale. This is one thing. The other thing which happened, another social change which happened when prosperity came to people was Sanskritization. This was more prevalent in rural India. When a particular community in a village became affluent, or when a particular caste group became affluent, the members of this caste group started adopting the practices, ritual and other practices of a caste group above this. And slowly they start adopting even the nomenclatures used by the caste group above this. And gradually their ritual status moves up in the society from a lower to a higher level. In other words, social status and social ranking adapt itself according to a cultural change called Sanskritization after some uh, some time after economic status changes. According to Srinivas, Sanskritization much more than westernization 
was the source of social mobility in rural south in rural india as opposed to urban india in urban india westernization was the source of social mobility in rural areas sanskritization now what is important about sanskritization is that sanskritization appeared to leave the social structure intact without fundamentally changing its structure it permitted changes within the social structure over a period of time it seemed to ensure both stability in the society and change so according to srinivas sanskritization was a major basis of rural social stability even when there was economic change so we have here three sets of opinions among economic anthropologists on three sets of issues relating to the relationship between institutions in the society and economic activity first we had weber who talked about the relationship between religion and the development of capitalism weber argued to sum up that the development of capitalism was strongly influenced by the rise of protestant religion not only did weber argue that the pockets where capitalism developed were also pockets where protestantism had come started growing he also pointed out that pockets in europe where catholicism was predominant were also pockets which were growing much slowly so he also pointed out that catholicism had a certain anti growth impulses anti capitalist impulses at least in the early stages in europe weber also argued that the existence of traditional religions like hinduism confucianism and so forth in the east enable the per perpetuation of a static traditional per per perspective in minds of people which ensured that the spirit of capitalism did not come about in these in these places so he was trying to draw a relationship between eastern religions i mean a comparison between eastern religions and western religion in the west he found that protestantism enabled capitalist ethos to develop he found that in the east the existence of traditional religions blocked the growth of capitalist ethos this was subsequently questioned as i said by singer and other sociologists through their studies following durkheim following weber was durkheim in our argument who showed that there was considerable correlation between the existence of social harmony or harmony within the individual in the society and the rate of economic change in the society he found that when there was rapid economic change the level of anomie in society grew normlessness he also found conversely that when economic change was much lower anomie was much narrower in its coverage this was because according to weber societies with economic rapid economic change which were all western societies were characterized by mechanical solidarity which was just a functional solidarity across the society as opposed to organic solidarity in traditional societies of the east which ensured greater continuity of relationships than in the west finally we also considered m n srinivas the indian sociologist who argued that there were two forces of social mobility in india sanskritization and westernization he found that sanskritization predominated rural areas and westernization was more common in urban areas in both cases a first economic movement within the group 
was supported by a movement of a Sanskritization type. So, you could say that social mobility in rural areas constituted the type Sanskritization whenever there was growth, whenever there was development. But when such a development existed in urban areas, it was more common for Weber to find, I am sorry, when more common for Srinivas to identify this urban areas with westernization rather than Sanskritization. We have now seen three fundamental approaches to the relationship between economic institutions, I am sorry, institutions and society and economic activities. To sum up, we found that economic theory could afford to overlook institutions because it made four very central postulates of perfect knowledge, uncertainty, rationality and hedonism. <coughs> However, once these postulates are removed, the behavior in economics becomes far more important than the theoretical results regarding equilibrium. And behavior in economic realm we find is strongly correlated with the institutions that exist in society. We found that there are three broad approaches which relate social institutions, political institutions with economic activity. The first was a, was a determinist Marxist approach which said that the economic base was everything and within the economic base production relations were central and this decidedly influenced the nature of social and political institutions which merely constitute the superstructure over the economic base of the society. So, by and large Marxian analysis argued that there was a one way relationship between institutions and economic phenomena. The one way was from economic change to institutions and not the other way around. In contrast, the transaction cost approach of North and others clearly showed that the relationship between institutions and economic phenomena was a lot more varied. On the one hand, there were institutions which minimized transaction costs in society, which survived because they minimized transaction costs. On the other hand, there were institutions which could not minimize transaction costs and therefore fell on the wayside as a society passed through. So, transaction cost was a major source of explaining the institutional history of society itself. This was the second approach. The third was economic anthropologi anthropological approach where we found different sociologists have given different explanations of the effect of social institutions on economic processes. We found Weber clearly identifying a positive role for the Protestant ethic in the emergence of capitalist spirit and conversely he found that such a capitalist spirit did not emerge in countries where traditional society prevailed. Durkheim argued that there was a strong correlation between anomie and economic change. And finally, Srinivas argued that there was a rural, rural and urban divide in whether Sanskritization was a source of social mobility with economic change or whether westernization was a source of social mobility with economic change. We have now summed up a study of relationships between economic activities and institutions we find that in the short run institutions appear to be dominating over economic activities, but in the long run economic activities themselves had the propensity to transform and change institutions. And the study as we found could be approached in, in a number of ways and we showed three different ways in which this relationship could be studied. And in the next hour that we teach we shall be studying evolutionary economics. Good evening.